Hello, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Good, happy Mother's Day to those of you who are mothers here. Welcome to New Promise this morning. Uh, if you are a guest visiting with us today, I want to invite you to fill out a little guest card that's in the seat back pocket in front of you. Uh, and then after worship, you can take it back to the little window there that's called the welcome window, and we will give you a present because, yay, you're here, and we're so happy. Um, also want you to know that um, we have an open communion table, which means that all who believe in Christ are welcome to commune with us, and so the way that that works is at the communion time, you come up via the center aisle, and there will be an acolyte here holding grape juice filled cups if you prefer grape juice, or you can grab an empty cup from one of these two stands if you prefer wine. Receive the bread, the wine, and then go back via the end aisles there. Um, also, if you have a prayer request this morning, also in the seat back pocket in front of you, you can pull that out, and when the basket comes around for offering, you can place that in there. You can request pastoral care or corporate prayer if you'd like, or if you'd rather have individual prayer, we have um, Sal Mendez here. He is a Stephen minister trained, and he'll be up over here in the choir area after the service for individual prayer. So, uh, just a few parish notes for this week. Um, we, uh, Pastor Joe is doing a hike, hiking with Pastor Joe. Next, is that next Saturday? Saturday. Yes, it is. Yes. This coming Saturday? Yep. Uh, leaving at 8 a.m. This is for youth. Bring a lunch and text Pastor Joe if you would like to uh, go. Um, we're also doing an interfaith fireside about uh, dementia with uh, Memory Matters, and this is happening on May 30th at the um, LDS Shadow Mountain Chapel, um, 124 North Valley View, so pretty close to here, uh, just down the, the road a bit. Um, our youth, or I mean our kids, uh, uh, K through 5, are meeting this Friday for third Friday. We do activities with the kids on the first and third Fridays, although this will be the last one of the year because they take the summer off because people are always traveling in the summer. So last chance until September. So come, come. And then summer worship begins on May 26th and uh, service will, become, uh, will begin at 9.30 then, and we do just one service during the summer from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, there is day, what? Do I need to say something? No, okay, sorry, sorry. Okay, day camp, uh, register today for day camp um, uh, just on the website, newpromiselutheran.church, and there's a thing uh, up at the top of the page that you can press a button and register. And then finally, uh, before we begin, I'd like to invite you to take a moment and we're gonna watch a little Mother's Day video. So. Hey mom, on Mother's Day, we talk a lot about what moms do, what the many beloved women do in our lives. Schedules, school, homework, holidays, birthdays, big moments, you know the drill. But today, we want to celebrate something more. Things that go unseen, but not unnoticed. You are a deep well of care and compassion, patience and sensitivity. You embrace sacrifice and service and put dreams on hold, rest to the side, and treasure away so your family can have more. You burn the midnight oil enter prayer closets and wear down carpets, bringing our needs to the Lord. You are the tireless teacher, the weariless guard. You think deeply, trust truth, and speak blessings that flow for generations. You encourage and empathize, an ear to listen, and a shoulder to cry on, an outstretched hand and a gathering arm. Filled with dignity, fearless in the furnace, pouring yourself out to fill those around you. You are the very picture of quiet strength. By God's grace, you help us become what we were meant to be. Thank you, moms, grandmothers, aunts, mentors, all of you, for being 
who you are. I invite you to stand and face the baptismal font as we begin our service this morning. It is in the waters of baptism that we enter into the promises of God, and so it is to the font that we face as we confess our sin and hear again God's promise of forgiveness. We come to the waters of mercy seeking forgiveness and new life. Let us pause to remember those things for which we need forgiveness. Holy and gracious God, we come to the water sorry for the wrongs we have caused to those we love and to those we don't know. Forgive us for the things we have thought, said, or done that are not in line with your desires for us or for this world. Forgive us. Forgive us and open our eyes to see all who we meet as children of God. Give us hands and hearts to show your boundless mercy to all in need. At the river, God's beloved son was baptized by John and anointed by the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, God opened the floodgates of his reconciling love, freeing us to be Easter people. Look, here's water. Receive the water of life, the forgiveness of sin in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We are listening, eager to learn. At the last trumpet, we will be changed. We will rise a new creation. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sin? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. So with you.
Lord of the resurrection, you died and were raised so that ultimately death would not prevail. Remind us daily that sin and even death have no power over us. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from Mark chapter 12. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the story about the bush, how God said to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is, not, he is God, not of the dead, but of the living. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. A reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which you also stand, through which you are also being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I hand it on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. For I am the least of the disciples, unfit, or the apostles, I am unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I have worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim that you have come to believe. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. But those who have also died in Christ have perished. For if this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For some death came through a human being. The resurrection of the death has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Listen, I will tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, imperishable, and we will be changed. 
for this perishable body must be put on must put on imperishability and this mortal body must put on immortality when this perishable body puts on imperishability and this mortal body puts on immortality then the saying that is written will be fulfilled death has been swallowed up in victory where o oh, death is your victory where o oh, death is your sting the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ the word of the lord thanks, thanks be, be to god At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a children's sermon with Nikki Hendricks. You guys are already so well trained. You already come all up and sit. Make it easy on me. Okay. Let's see, we can make room. There you go. Yep, squeeze in. Here, come sit by me. Good morning, friends. Hi. It's Mother's Day. You have to be nice to me. <laughs> so today's message is kind of tricky, but I have an easier way that'll make sense, hopefully, to some of you. Can anyone tell me your favorite movie? <gasps> Frozen 2. Okay, that's perfect. What's your favorite movie? What's your favorite movie, Mila? Happy God. I don't think I've seen that one. You'll have to tell me about it later. Migration. Okay, we're going to talk about Frozen 2 first for a minute. Because Frozen 2 came after which movie? Frozen 1. So did you watch Frozen 1? Yes. And when it ended, were you like, okay, it's over? Or were you like, I feel like there's more to the story? Yeah, I kind of feel like there was more. And obviously, other people thought there was more because they made a second movie, right? So the movie, you watched it, you enjoyed it, and then it ended, and you were like, oh. Maybe someday they'll make a third. Maybe they'll make a third, right? Frozen 2 came out. Did you enjoy watching that? You must because it's your favorite. When it ended, did you feel like it's over, there's nothing left? Right? There could be more, right? So that's kind of what the scripture is talking about today, is that, unfortunately, we all have to end. Movies have to end. Our favorite books have to end. Our favorite TV shows have to end, even if we love them, even if we feel like sometimes movies, TV shows, books end, and we're like, really? That was the ending? I feel like there's more. There is more. But we all have to end. Kind of as a bummer, but it's just the way it works, right? Our scripture tells us that we die because Adam died. We're human. We just can't go on forever and ever. But the best part about it is we get to enjoy our life just like we get to enjoy watching our favorite movies, TV shows, books. And then at the end, we can go up to heaven and be reunited because of Jesus, right? We learned about Easter. Jesus was resurrected. That's what we believe. So the end doesn't have to be the actual end. But we have to have somewhat of an end. It's kind of weird. But does that help a little bit? So that the end's not always the end? Yeah. So we don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to be scared. And we get to enjoy the time we have here. Like when we get to all be together. Sound good? Okay. Let's stand up and have a prayer. You can hold hands, pinkies, I'll hold yours. Mila, can you hold my elbow? Okay. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for all of our moms on this special Mother's Day. And thank you for the ability to enjoy the time that we have here on earth and that we may look forward to the end, even if it comes unexpectedly or not the way we wanted in our favorite movie, book, or TV show, or even in our life but we look forward to our day up in heaven where we can be reunited with all those that we love. In Jesus' name we pray, 
Amen. Thank you, Nikki, that was excellent. And that was a tough passage to have to relate to kids. So I'm grateful it was you, not me. So. Let's pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So it feels like uh, in the narrative lectionary for the past couple of weeks, we've been stuck in this sermon series on 1 Corinthians, right? I mean, two weeks ago, we got a story from 1 Corinthians, and then last week, we had another one from 1 Corinthians. And what we know about this church so far from these last two lessons is that there is some division in this church, right? They're divided over who baptized them. They're divided over the use and purpose of spiritual gifts, which led to whole chapter 13 thing. Next week, we're actually going to get one more passage from uh, 1 Corinthians. But in our lesson today, we find out that there's yet one more thing that this church is divided over, and it's the whole issue of resurrection. You may have noticed that our passage was pretty long today, but that is only about half of what Paul has to say. We've cut out a significant chunk of chapter 15. And I tell you that only to say that this is such an important issue for Paul that he goes to great lengths to explain and address this issue. Because for Paul, this is of paramount importance for Christian identity, for Christian faith, for Christian hope. All the writers of the New Testament, without exception, assume the resurrection as a fundamental confession of Christian faith and hope. Had Jesus not been raised, the disciples who were devastated and humiliated at his crucifixion would simply have gone back to what they were doing before, fishing or collecting taxes, whatever. And if Jesus had not been raised from the dead, the Apostle Paul and other Jews would simply not have accepted the possibility that Jesus could be proclaimed as Lord. And had Jesus not been raised from the dead, there would be no reason to find hope in his death at all. But part of why this issue, um, excuse me, part of why this is an issue for the Christians in Corinth is because in the Greek culture, which is the culture in which they lived, the idea of a resurrection, a physical resurrection, was ridiculous, is a silly idea, right? Thanks to uh, philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, that was something that the Greeks regarded as untasteful, right? So Paul is confronting a whole aspect of Greek culture in addressing this. For Paul, resurrection, not just Jesus' resurrection, but the physical resurrection of, be of believers is a non-negotiable. And it's also true that for Paul, the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of believers is one phenomenon. It's not separate events. You can see that in what he writes. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify that God, uh, that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. For those... Um, for those also who have died in Christ will perish. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now Paul begins this whole chapter by reviewing the very message that he proclaimed to them from the first day when he was there, right? He says, I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, 
And then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still living. Then he appeared to James, then to the other apostles, and then last of all to one untimely born. He appeared also to me. Paul is reminding them of the essential tenets of the faith that he taught them from the beginning, the essential tenets that they that led them to believe and to follow Christ in the very beginning. And all of these things are rooted in the resurrection. But somehow, for some of the Corinthians anyway, these have become non-essential for them. Now we don't get a full picture of what they actually believed or didn't believe about the resurrection. Paul doesn't give us that kind of detail, but we do get a glimpse of the issues that were causing questions for them. Paul addresses two questions that he raises as if they were brought up by the the Corinthians themselves. How is it possible that the dead can be raised? And what kind of bodies will the dead possess? To the second question, Paul has this wonderful illustration that is not included in our lesson today. But if you go back to chapter 15, you can read the whole thing, but the illustration is this. It's like a seed that dies, and you bury it in the ground, and it grows up with a completely different form, a new body. This is Paul's illustration for the way resurrection and new bodies might happen, right? And to the first question, he says that the trumpets will sound, and the dead will be raised, the perishable will become imperishable, the mortal immortal. Now, clearly both of these things, both of the answers Paul has to these questions are a bit of speculation, right? Paul is not talking from experience here. He's talking from faith. Paul is simply taking the promises of God that are there in the resurrection of Christ and projecting them out, imagining how they might take place for those who belong to Christ. But the fact that Paul even addresses these questions mean they're not unimportant questions. They're questions we still grapple with today, right? In fact, at my Tuesday Bible study, these questions dominated our conversation. And we spent a lot of time speculating about both of those things, right? How does resurrection happen? And what kind of bodies will we have? And is that, you know, what happens if you're cremated, right? What if your ashes are mixed with somebody else's ashes by accident? You know, will there be a mix-up in the resurrection too? Right? And what about this whole trumpet sound thing? What if we're not in the vicinity of where those trumpets go off? Will we not know? Or will we all get a text? Will it be an attachment on an email or something, right? So that we can hear the trumpet sound too. Obviously, we did our own uh, fair amount of speculating, And then, later in the week, a member of our congregation brought to me a text she had received from her daughter. And it was a text of the questions that her son was asking because of the impending death of their dog, Emmy. Here are some of his questions. What will happen to Emmy's body? How does she go over the rainbow rainbow bridge without a body? Will she have friends there? Will she remember us? This is my favorite. Will dad lend God his truck so that he can drive Emmy over the rainbow bridge? I have no idea how they answered any of these questions, but they're great questions. And notice how early they begin to ask and grapple with those questions. I mean, these are kind of whimsical and humorous, but anybody who's lost a loved one knows these are serious questions, right? For many, the inability to answer these questions in a way that makes sense can undermine faith and stifle hope. So I want to just conclude here with two things that I think are at the heart of what Paul wants to convey in this whole chapter. First of all, 
Even though Paul doesn't engage in, it does engage, excuse me, in some speculation about how the resurrection might take place and the kind of bodies we will have, Paul's faith does not rest on the truth of his speculations. And Paul would, would not want our faith to rest on the truth of his speculations. Paul's faith rests on the promises of God. And indeed, the promises of God are the only proper foundation for our faith as well. The important thing is not how these things take place, but the God who promises all things is able to bring those promises to fulfillment, even if we don't understand fully how that will happen. That's number one. The second thing is that Paul is not just interested in affirming the resurrection for believers in Corinth who've begun to question and wonder what will happen after they die. Paul also wants them to understand what the resurrection means for them now, even as they are living. For Paul, the resurrection means that we don't need to fear death or condemnation. Death is swallowed up in victory, as Paul says. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The very last chapter of, um, excuse me, the very last verse of chapter 15 is sadly also not part of our lesson today, so we didn't hear it. But I think it's an important part of Paul's overall argument, uh, especially on this point. Um, In verse 58, Paul says this, therefore, meaning everything Paul has said up to this point is all a prelude to this conclusion. Therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. If there is no resurrection, life boils down to this. You're born, you spend a lifetime struggling and toiling to find a place in the world, and then you die. The end, no sequel, right? If there is no resurrection, what's the point? If there's no resurrection, what is it all for? If there's no resurrection, then the the writer of Ecclesiastes is right when he says there's nothing better for mortals than to eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, live for yourself, make the most, for tomorrow you die. If there's no resurrection, we're but a momentary voice in a cacophony of sounds in a world that is destined for destruction, all to be forgotten when the house of cards comes falling down. This, for Paul, is why the resurrection matters. The resurrection gives meaning to life. The resurrection means that what we do in this life is not in vain. The resurrection means that death is not the final word. So the climax of Paul's argument and the salient promise of the resurrection is that we need not fear or live, uh, excuse me, live in fear or succumb to hedonism or fatalism. Thanks to the resurrection that has begun with Christ, we're free to live in the confidence that in God, nothing is lost. That in Christ, all things are made new. And that in the resurrection, death is swallowed up in life. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's stand as we sing.
I invite you to profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Trusting in the promise of the resurrection, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Risen God, through the power of your act of love on the cross and your subsequent resurrection, you shattered the power of death and opened to us the way of everlasting life. Make us confident in this promise that we might live and work fearlessly to bring about your reign in the here and now. God of new life, in mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the redemption of all that you have made and trust that the promise of eternal life extends to this beautiful earth upon which we stand. God of new life, in mercy, hear our prayer. Renew hope in the face of discouragement that our leaders continue to persist in the often frustrating work of addressing inequity so that all might have life and have it abundantly. God of new life, in mercy hear our prayer. Comfort all who grieve the loss of loved ones, the loss of health, or any other loss with the promise of the resurrection. We also pray for those listed in promising news who have asked for prayer. Prayers from the congregation are now invited, either aloud or from our hearts. God of new life, in mercy, hear our prayer. We uplift every community throughout the world where death is a harsh reality due to war, famine, disease, natural disasters, and other factors. Strengthen all people in the hope that death will not have the last word and spur us to action to address those pressing issues so that your beloved children might live long, healthy lives in this world. God of new life, in mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, thank you, uh, loving and nurturing moms and other women who serve in your kingdom. Please bless them with faith, wisdom, and peace. God of new life, in mercy, hear our prayer. We can be grateful for all the departed saints because we live in a hope that Jesus Christ will once again, that we will once again see them in the flesh in the resurrection. Keep us strong in our gratitude and our hope each day. God of new life, in mercy, hear our prayer. We place in your arms all for whom we pray, out loud or in our hearts, confident in your mercy and grace, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all, and also with you. Please share the sign of peace.
invite you to stand as we bring forward our gifts and offerings. God, who provides all we need in this life, we proclaim our gratitude for your generosity and trust in your promised future. We return these gifts to the service of this community of faith and all that you have created. Accept them, we pray, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. For all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And let us pray as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our resurrected Savior Jesus invites us now into his presence to share in bread and wine a foretaste of the feast of heaven which has no end. Come and eat for all is prepared. Bobby, the blood of Christ is poured out for you.
Shepherding God, you have prepared a table before us and nourished us with your love. Send us from this banquet to proclaim the abundant mercy of Jesus, our Redeemer and friend. Amen. Now may God, the Father of resurrection power, Christ, the Son of unending joy, and the Holy Spirit who brings Easter hope, bless you now and always. Amen. Hallelujah, go in peace, rejoice, and be glad.